1 Thessalonians chapter number 4 tonight, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and uh, as you're finding your spot there, um, how many of you thought that my brother sounds like me audibly, vocally? Um, everybody says that to us. I have two brothers, and other than my mother on the phone, you cannot tell us apart unless she has, you have some context. I don't know what it is about the snowed, uh, that deep, resonant voice that puts you to sleep, especially when you're on jet lag. Um, I could feel, could, didn't it almost hurt like your eyes hurt for him as you heard him talking? Literally, it took him two days to get there. And, um, and it's just, it's a commitment. And you could, try, you could tell he's trying to figure out what, it's not Sunday where he was when he recorded that, I'm sure. But I appreciate him weighing in, pray for him uh, with his travels. So he goes, I think if I understand his rhythm, every three months he's doing a regional conference somewhere in the world and meeting with the missionaries that they have. And uh, so that's a new commitment for him. He kind of stayed more local once he would get to the UK. So this is a new season for him. And I appreciate you praying for my brother and a lot of the weight that he now shoulders as the general director of a mission board. Excited to see how God's growing his ministry. First Thessalonians chapter 4 tonight. Let's pick up, if you will, in verse number 9. So we're going to read verses 9 to 12. And our goal is to be done as close to 6.30 as we can. Then we're going to go enjoy some ice cream together. Or for you healthy people, your tofu, whatever, if they serve that there. I don't think Hartzler's does that, do they? They're, they're you know, redneck, country, you know, they're, they don't serve that kind of stuff. So if you want that, you'll have to make a pit stop on your way. First Thessalonians chapter 4, let's begin in verse 9. But it's touching brotherly kindness. So this would be in contrast to the subject matter he just talked about back in verses 1 through Eight that we covered last time. Ye need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another, and indeed ye do it toward all the brethren which are in Macedonia, but we beseech you, brethren, that ye increase more and more. Verse 11, and that ye study to be quiet and to do your own business and to work with your own hands as we have commanded you. Lastly, verse 12, that ye may walk honestly toward them that are without, and that ye may have lack of Nothing. So we're talking about being a next level church and things that we have to do and be to reach the next level in our development as a church. And I just want to say this as we begin, God is really blessing our church. Um, we're running out of chairs. Like we just ordered 50 more this past week and we won't get them until Christmas and I'm a little nervous what we're going to do. Um, but building was packed today and we had folks responding in different ways to the preaching of God's word and the worship. God has been so good to us. But if we only superficially or in the external areas if we grow and we don't do so on the inside, we cannot be everything God wants. So today we're going to look at, tonight we're going to look at next level hearts. How can we have the heart, the heart that God wants us to have as a church, maintain it, grow it for his glory and honor. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for the joy it is to be back in your house tonight. Thank you for these that are here, new folks and those that have been with us for most, if not all of this run that you've had us in as a church. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for not just who is being impacted here, but out of here as we bless and encourage sister churches and as we reach out to our community. Pray, Father, as we now consider your word and uh, its applications to our lives, specifically to our hearts, pray that you would guard our heart as a church, you would grow our heart as a church, that we would have um, a greater capacity um, to be everything you want us to be, first toward you and then toward others as you give us um, those increasing opportunities. I pray you bless our study tonight, move and work in our hearts as only you can, and we'll be careful to give you the praise and glory for it. In Christ's name, amen. One of the things that I find interesting is, have you ever had something that everybody thinks is amazing? You gotta go there, you gotta try it, you gotta eat it, you gotta buy it, whatever the thing is, and then you go, and there's lines, and everybody's all passionate, and they got their, like, T-shirts on about this place or whatever. And you're kind of like, I just don't get it, guys. Some things, they live up to the hype. Um, we were in, we were out west this summer with our family vacation, and we do not have here in Ohio, the, I don't know where the closest one is, what are called In-N-Out Burgers. How many of you have eaten an In-N-Out Burger? I know I'm going to lose you after I ask that, okay? There is a fan club of In-N-Out Burgers that are, like, rabid, like, crazies, Okay. They have shirts, and they have hats, and they, they're always posting pictures, selfies with their burger, you know, right before they guzzle it down. And so we had had this conversation, and my son Ian, uh, he had never had an In-N-Out burger, and everybody's always talking about it. 
So we drove, I think we went to the Hoover Dam that day. It was like a five-hour drive from where we were staying. So it was already a long day. And he said, hey, Dad, on the way back, we talked about what we are going to do for dinner. He's like, could we try an In-N-Out? And he was like pretty pumped about it. So we drove out of our way, stopped in, and it was hilarious to watch him. I knew this was probably going to happen because I, I like In-N-Out. I'm not against the In-N-Out burger. Um, we're sitting there. We order our food, and he sits. He's, it's in front of him, his little red basket. He takes a bite of the fries and the burger, and he kind of just looks at me. I'm like, I just shrug my shoulders like, it's a burger. It's just a burger, you know. <laughs> And uh, to him, I think he was expecting, like, the angels to sing and, like, <laughs> I don't know, something, you know, miraculous to occur. Um, another, not picking on them, if you work there or you're affiliated with them, but Panera. I love Panera, but I always leave hungry, okay? That, no offense, okay? I pay 30 bucks for my half bowl of soup and sandwich, and, okay, where's the rest of it? You know, just, but some people love Panera. It's just Panera this, Panera that. Um, things that people love... And, and, and we sometimes we almost create the aura on our own. Can I tell you, as it relates to the things we're going to talk about tonight, these are non-negotiables. These are things that we have to love. Uh, these are things that our heart has to be given to if we're to be the church that God wants us to be. We don't ever have to go back to Hartzler's after tonight. We don't have to go to Panera ever again or In-N-Out Burger. But these are things we have to own, we have to lean into, not just on the external, but on the internal. Um, and maybe jot this down as we begin tonight, our heart will only reach the next level when, first of all, it begins in our hearts. Um, so our church, I'm sorry, our church cannot reach the next level until this begins in our heart. Our hearts is always, are always the lid or the ceiling of our potential as a ministry. And I'm just going to read the verses to you, maybe jot down the reference and read on your own time. But 1 Corinthians 13, listen to these words from Paul to a local church. He says this in verse 1, Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, and, though I, and so that I can remove mountains, so that I can remove mountains, that's how much faith I have, and have not charity, I am what? Nothing. Verse 3, And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, that's rather zealous, is it not? And he says this, and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. So if we don't get the heart, the love aspect right, everything else we do as a ministry is just, it's of no use. It's of no lasting or enduring value or significance in God's eyes. So just to set the table tonight, verses 1 to 8 deals with the wrong way to relate to other people on a heart level. He talks about, if you remember, we talked about sanctification and different things that we should not be engaged in, fornication for one, which is mentioned in verse number three, and lust, and where we're, we're relating to others in a way that is not what God wants. Now he's going to talk about the positive side and what the right heart position or disposition should be uh, toward those around us. So the question tonight is in a day of settling for a version of church that is rarely, if ever, practicing true godly love, how do we as a church return to the heartbeat that Christ originally, originally gave to um, his people? Let's talk about two hearty characteristics that we need to have as a church if we're going to be and reach the next level in our areas of uh, contribution. Number one, this may seem obvious to you, but number one, our heart needs to be one that is loving. So our church needs to have a heart toward others that is loving. It was interesting. We had a couple visit today. We had a ton of visitors. I can't keep track of all of them. But we had a couple visit today who was from North Columbus Baptist Church. And they said, hey, we're from Brother Wolven's church. I know Brother Wolven. He was a fellow youth pastor of a sister church I grew up in. And uh, they said, hey, we're glad to be here. We're just on a weekend getaway to Amish country. I said, that is crazy. My father-in-law, Brother Yoder, is preaching for your pastor today in North Columbus. So Brother Moses was filling pulpit there, and they were here. Um, so that was kind of a funny little just random thing. How in the world did that happen? But they said, they just, they were complimenting the church. They said everything, and they had, it was kind of random, the things that, that blessed them or encouraged them. I can't remember all of them, but one of them was the bathrooms were so clean. Like, they just loved that. Um, and so for you ladies that regularly contribute to that, that matters. But they went through a series of things of, uh, that just about the church, people felt, made them feel welcome. Basically, the summary, if I could put it this way, was we felt loved today. The church loved on us. We felt welcomed. We're from another church. We're just here for the weekend. Instead of us discouraging them, we encouraged them. 
just by having a heart that was loving and welcoming. And so we need this as a church. We need to have as a church a heart that is loving. In fact, I would say to you that this, the native purpose of our hearts is love. That's our, that's our native language. That's what God gave us hearts for, um, is to express love, not just to him, but to others. So let me give you a couple things quickly in these verses that we've read already tonight. Number one, jot this down in this area of love. Go next level with us as a church with love as taught by God. So the standard of our love, the growth that needs to take place in our heart that is loving, is we need to go to the next level with love as taught by God. Look at verse 9. But as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I (laughs) write unto you. Notice this. For ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. The word brotherly love that's found here is the word from which we get Philadelphia, right? The city of brotherly love. This is love between members of the family. This is clan love. This is I love you though you don't smell so great. I love you though you just irritated me again with that little thing you know that needles me. I still love you. That's, that's the kind of love we're talking about that God teaches us to have for uh, one another. Um, and so for these early believers, think about this. We, we talked about a lot of them were Gentiles. When they followed Christ and they went all in with the church in Thessalonica, they turned their back on their family. Their family rejected them. They didn't necessarily choose to reject their family, but their family rejected them. They were looking for new family support and relationships. And I don't know that we realize how many people come here looking for that. Um, their grown children don't give them the time of day ever. Um, their spouse, they may be in the same house, but they don't sleep in the same room. They don't talk about anything meaningful. They have nothing in common. Um, there are widows and widowers. There are broken, there's broken, and we ought to be a place they can come and find this kind of Philadelphia love, a love that is taught to us. If we know God, we're a part of his family. We're going to look like him and love like him. Do people find that love when they come here? Um, I I think some instructions that we get as believers, other believers teach us. But this is one we ought to innately know because we have relationship with God. I shouldn't have to tell you to love people. You shouldn't need anybody to teach you at least to do it. You may need to learn how to do it, but God is the one who teaches us by his own example. He gives us his spirit. What is one of the fruit of, part of the fruit of the spirit? Love, right? Right? So God is the one who gives us access to all we need to express and to embody love to others. Hold your place there quickly in 1 Thessalonians. Go to 1 John, would you, for a moment? There's an interesting little verse. I'm going to work backwards to it about this fact that God sometimes teaches us things directly. We don't need some intermediary or some secondary person to model it for us or teach it. We have direct access to it through God. Go back to 1 John chapter number 4 and verse 16. All right, this is setting the table for the key verse in this section. He says, And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him. All right, so God is love. He doesn't have love. He is love. You put an equal sign, you can say love is God, God is love. Either way, both are true statements. Now go back to chapter 2 and look, if you would, verse 20. John says this to these believers, which he's trying to affirm that they are saved and give them confidence in that salvation. But this is a really interesting verse for us to chew on. We don't have time to get to it at length tonight. He says, ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. Now go down to verse 27. But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it has taught you, ye shall abide in him. So there's some things that God just, he, he gives it to us directly, and one of those is love. And when we are off with love, we don't have a heart that's loving, here's the challenge for us tonight, we are not being taught by God. We're being taught by some other profile or presentation of even God or church. If we cannot love people, we are not following God. He is not our teacher. When we're judging them or we're mocking them, as we talked about a few weeks ago with our sarcasm, when we don't have a loving tone toward all people, God is not our instructor. And so God gives us the example of love in John 3, 16, and he deposits within us, Romans chapter 5 and verse 5, his spirit who gives us the ability to love all people. So therefore, if we aren't at the next level with love, that's on us. God has given us everything we need to be the loving church 
that he has called us to be. Wearsby put it this way, have you noticed that the animals do instinctively what is necessary to keep them alive and safe? Fish do not attend classes to learn how to swim. Birds by nature put their wings, uh, put out their wings and flap them in order to fly. It is nature that determines action. Because a fish has a fish's nature, it swims. Because a hawk has a hawk's nature, it flies. And because a Christian has God's nature, he loves. Because God is love. So if we are associated with God, we should be a loving church. And the closer we are aligned with and associated with God, the more we're growing in this area of love. And so the standard of love is not anything or anyone else but God himself. Nothing holds us back or causes us to settle more than letting that thing or that other person be the standard of what, quote, is love. May it only be, may it always be God himself. All right, number two, go to verse 10, back in our text there. Back in 1 Thessalonians 4, look, if you will, now at verse number 10. And indeed ye do it toward all the brethren, Paul says to these believers, which are in Macedonia. But we beseech you, brethren, that you increase more and more. All right, number two. So let's talk about a second area that we need to work at being next level with as it relates to hearts that are loving. Number two, go next level with love that is always expanding. Go next level with love that is always expanding. Uh, I'm a part of several uh, ministry leader forums online where we can field questions to each other, and they're very constructive. They're not gossipy or complaining about the people that we lead, just helping each other with resources and support. And this afternoon, a friend of mine posted on um, the, one of the forums that I'm a part of. He said, does anyone else have someone who attends your church who brings an emotional support animal? Um, and he, I, I think he was asking it as a serious question. He said she actually brought paperwork to prove that she has the right to have this emotional support animal with her, and uh, there are cases where that um, is necessary and, as we understand, appropriate. But he said this at the end. He said, just looking to see if this is something I should rock the boat about, you know, whether to allow this. He said, all I'm saying is we don't want a zoo at church, okay? Um, so who to include and what to include might be the question that he, my brother is navigating. And I'm just, all I'm thinking is I'm glad it's not me. I have nothing to add to the conversation, but I got my own set of issues, but at least I don't have this one. Okay. He's just worried that eventually he's going to be pastoring a zoo. That's, that's what he's concerned about. Sometimes it feels that way to be honest with you. It gets a little interesting at times, but trying to be how, how inclusive, how expansive should my love be to other people and the things that are affiliated or associated with them. Now, I want you to go back to verse 6 of chapter 3, because Paul is not asking them to do something that they're not already doing. This is key. Go back to chapter 3 and verse 6. He says, when Timotheus came from you, remember Paul couldn't go, so he sends Timothy, and brought us good tidings, notice this, of your faith, and notice these next two words, and what? Charity. So when Paul gets the report from Timothy that prompts him to write this letter, specifically the verse that we just read in verse 10, he's not telling them to do something that they're not doing. He's just challenging them to do more of it, to be growing in it, to be developing it, uh, this area of love. Can we really have too much or reach too high of a level in our ability to love people? Like I think sometimes we, we almost act like we've arrived in this area of love. Every time I see the contrast of Jesus Christ, I'm told to love my wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. I don't know about you other men. I feel like I come up woefully short, and my wife would amen if she does that, okay, in services. I feel inadequate. Every time I bump up to God as the standard of love, I need to work on some things. Do we feel that tension in our lives? Do we feel that as a church? Did we really get love perfect this morning? Or are we too busy to stay a little longer and give an ear to someone that needed just us to listen? or a hug, or a talk, or was it all about our focus, and our kids, and our schedule, and our lunch, and the love of God? Was it really fully everything it should have been this morning? Um, it's something for us to constantly be expanding and working at, starting with me. This is an effort uh, that we need to give ourselves to. Now, when he says in verse 10, this was not like they just tipped their toes in the water of love. Notice the, the comprehensiveness. He says, you do toward all the brethren which are in all Macedonia. So this church with newbie believers has already gotten to a pretty significant level of love. They're loving all the brethren in all of Macedonia. That's a, that's a broad statement. That's, that's a level of love 
that was impressive from a human perspective, but Paul calls them to go further. He calls them to continue to grow in their capacity for love. Um, And so Paul tenderly urges them to increase more and more. Back in verse 12 of chapter 3, he goes on to say, The Lord make you to increase and abound in love one to another and toward all men. So he keeps calling them to this expansiveness of love. Um, I saw this the other day, (laughs) pastor in Pennsylvania near my brother. He posted this picture, and then I'll give you kind of the explanation. So I don't know if you can see it, make it out completely. The top picture is of a coffee shop. And you have a bunch of people in line waiting to get their coffee, you know, grumpy and just waiting to get their coffee. The bottom picture, I think, is of a cafe in Paris or somewhere. And he's contrasting the way we get coffee as Americans versus how those in other parts of the world do coffee. Um, and, and I thought he had a wise you know, just kind of takeaway for we in the context of the church. He said, I saw this photo, the contrast between these photos, and thought it had insight, not just about coffee, but how we do church. He said, we decide to rush in and out of church and wonder why our lives are not connected to others more. Sometimes to get a seat at this coffee shop that you see at the bottom, you have to show up early, but you always stay longer than you plan because of the friendship and fellowship that is so good. How about this Sunday showing up early, building friendships, meeting total strangers, lingering after longer than normal, and just helping out those around you? And that's what we do, isn't it? We queue in a line to avoid people where we need to be growing in our love. You've got to take time to do that. And I'm saying that to myself, the guy who's got the schedule and the the routine. We have to give ourselves to growing in love with others. You cannot have the brotherly kindness, the brotherly love in verse 9, if you're not around the brethren. Yeah, oh, I'm loving. Who are you loving? When are you loving? And when are you doing when it's inconvenient for you, but what they need from you? That's what we need to go to the next level as a ministry. I was just watching those who work in our bus ministry. um, Service went a little long with the baptisms and the long-winded preacher, and they're trying to get the riders together. Have you ever thought about those who work in our bus ministry? They don't have lunch. They don't get lunch until probably 1.30. They're giving a little extra of their day. It's not a huge deal, but it is, right, weekly, just loving on those people with all their backstories One of them raised their hand about salvation this morning that we're talking to about that. So it it takes that kind of time and sacrifice. Our church needs to grow, ever grow, in this area of love. Why do we need to love the brethren? Because where there is unity, according to Psalm 133, God gives his blessing, right? How beautiful it is for the brethren to dwell together in unity. The end of that verse is all the blessings that God gives. I want those blessings. I want them not just for our benefit, but for those impacted by our ministry. So we have to be willing to lean in and to grow in this area of love. Um, Heidi and I have talked about this regularly, and I ask you this question. Those of you who are married or at one point were married, maybe your spouse is with the Lord, um, or maybe your life has not had that perfect story and you're navigating all of that, But for those of us who have marriages where there's a meaningful history with that person, I'll give you this scenario and want you to think about this for a second. One of the things that Heidi and I talk about is we wish we had met each other earlier. She usually is the one to initiate these conversations for the record, okay? But I follow her lead, and I agree with her, as every wise husband should. But then we'll ask this conversation, if we could do it over again, would we? like just to prolong the years or the time that we have together. And here's where we always land after we kind of wrestle with that concept, because you ladies are great at the hypotheticals that we guys try to not answer wrongly this what if, you know, and are you going to marry within three months after I die, you know, those kind of things. And um, so anyway, her and I were talking about this, and where we always seem to land is this. Yes, I would love to have more time, but if we went back to where we started, we wouldn't have what we have right now, right? Like there's a depth that comes to a relationship that I'm sure in 10 years we'll have the same answer about if we could go back to today. Um, So so the the depth of our love is often shaped by the trials and challenges and just abrasive things about life, right? Uh, And so our church needs to always be growing, and it's the deeper kind of love we're talking about tonight, not the superficial or the puppy love or the honeymoon phase of relationship. We're growing in our love for one another and for the Lord. See, next level churches are always examining their hearts and expanding their heart's capacity to love more and more like their God. Where are we tonight settling for a a stagnant kind of, this is as far as I'm willing to go with my love? 
That's the lid to our ministry. That's the lid to what God could do, not just in us, but through us for his glory. And so may we not settle for inferior additions of love. May we go forward and be like God uh, in this area. All right, number two, go to verse 11. He says this, after challenging them to have hearts that are loving, verse number 11, and that you study to be quiet and to do your own business and to work with your own hands as we have commanded you. All right, number two, hearts that are a heart that is responsible. A heart that is responsible. So our heart first needs to be loving. That's something we have to work at to go next level. Number two, we have to have a sense of responsibility. Heidi, we had some of the boys over, some of your sons over last weekend. Landon has a little belated birthday thing, and they did a board game day. And a bunch of nerds, you know, they're all hanging out, playing games. And um, Heidi was joking, Caleb, who leaves, I think, Thursday for his first semester of college. And, of course, Heidi's always, you know, something about girls. And so he, she's talking about, you know, in chapel, they may force a girl to sit next to you or some class. And so those are your opportunities, you know. And the, the boys are all kind of snickering, you know, kind of sheepishly pretending they've never thought of these kind of things before. And um, I saw this picture. Let's see if this hits you the way it hit me. So here's the picture. Right, a couple kissing, and then here was the caption. Um, this pretty much sums up my love life. I'm the person in the blue, <laughs> watching the couple that's in love. Okay, um, you know, sometimes with love, we tend to act like it just happens, like they love me, I love them, and not just in a romantic sense. But can I just tell you tonight? Listen to me. Our love and the objects of our love, those kind of things, those interactions, don't just happen. Or the fact that we are perceived in our community as being unloving, that is our responsibility. And churches that go next level own that. They dare to ask that. What does our community think of our church? Do they think we're loving? When they visited six months ago and when they came today, did they feel like we've moved forward with love? That that's what they need to sense in our hearts. Same is true of our kids and grandkids and those that we impact. Do we take responsibility for the heart disposition we have uh, toward others? It is, a, it is a matter of personal responsibility. All right, so Paul here says in these last two verses we're going to look at tonight that, that it's our job to take care of our business, to own our responsibilities, and that's a way to love on others with um, the ministry God has given us. All right, let me give you two things as it relates to that. Number one. Go next level with responsibility in your work ethic. So in verse 11, he talks about owning your areas of responsibility first in what you do in work. Now, this word study that's found in verse 11 is not a reference to books and reading. It has more to do with a desire or a focus. You're, You're focused on what God has given to you. You're studying it. You're evaluating it. You're trying to get better in the areas that God has entrusted to you. Now, here's the context of why it feels like Paul kind of goes on a tangent here. The Thessalonians, we believe, probably heard Paul teach and then got some of this information through, through Timothy, and they thought Jesus is coming back, and they just abandoned their jobs. A quick example of that, go to 2 Thessalonians. So Paul actually has to follow up on this in his second letter. Go to verse 10 of chapter 3. So he's trying to call them back. Don't, don't quit your job. Don't, don't abdicate your personal responsibilities just because you know at some point Jesus is coming back. Uh, second, uh, Thess- Thessalonians 3, look at verse 10. For even when we were with you, we commanded you that if any would not work, neither should he eat. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busy bodies. Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ, that with quietness, here's come some of the same phraseology we just read in 1 Thessalonians, that with quietness they, they work and they eat their own bread. And so these believers, one of the problems they had in their ranks with all their good points was that some people had misunderstood the promise of Christ's return and just left all of their personal responsibilities. Um, We must be responsible with the the season of life we're in, the job that God has given us, whatever our our relational responsibilities are, we must own our responsibilities. Can I tell you, nothing slows the church down more, and I love you enough to tell this to you, nothing slows our church down more than people who let other people do what they should be doing. 
when they're already doing what they should be doing. And therefore now, because you're not faithful or I'm not faithful, you're not doing your part, now I'm doing two parts, or if I'm not doing my part, you're doing two parts. Nothing slows us down more from reaching our full potential than owning our personal responsibility. We just had the fair worker meeting this afternoon. It was awesome. The room was packed, and if you want to get in on that, you still can. But we just went from four-hour slots to three-hour slots, and Pastor Dave was saying we need to share the responsibility. The moment we add another slot per day, that, that's four slots now every day that we have to fill that's extra. And so those are the kind of things. we got to do these things together. You do your part. I do my part. We all share in what God has given us as a church, having work ethic. Greeks in this day would have shunned manual labor. Like the, it wasn't, man, look at that hard working man. You, you tried to avoid even ever being perceived as working with your hands. It was looked on as a social Um, kind of you were lesser if you couldn't avoid the work that you were engaged in. So Paul here pushes back against the cultural norms of the day. Uh, What did Paul do? He was a tent maker. Christ was was a carpenter. He's, He's pointing them back to the work that was a part of the Christian faith. I heard one individual say this just recently. They said, God made everything good. Listen to this. Therefore, man can perform the most meaningful task knowing that he is in touch with the creator's handiwork. Like if I'm sweeping a floor, what I'm grabbing to sweep that floor with is particles and elements and and atoms of something that God made. The dust on the floor, everything that I engage in, the most menial task, if God made it, then it matters. And me stewarding that well and managing that well is of great significance in the sight of the Lord. And so Paul calls them to take responsibility with a work ethic. Um, I say this regularly to young men who will talk to me, him looking for a job, and I'll say, make finding a job your job. Spend 40 hours a week looking for a job. Like, where's our work ethic? Well, where's our work ethic? Not just personally, but in ministry. It takes work to reach the next level in our relationship with God. And so Paul here encourages them as he encourages us to do um, the same. So if I could summarize for you in kind of our vernacular, verse number 11... He encourages them to do these things. First, don't seek the limelight, so just be content with doing your part. Mind your own business. Be self-supporting. These are the things that we ought to give ourselves to. Um, I shared this this last week, but I came across this um, guy who said, all the time we spend talking about other people's bodies, gossiping about other people's relationships, and criticizing other people's business, keep your eyes on your own paper. Work on your own body, nurture your own relationships, improve your own business. We all have plenty to improve. Just focus on your part and tell me to do the same when I get in your business. We need to own our areas of responsibility. Our church is defined as much by what we accomplish Monday through Saturday as what we do on any given Sunday. And you doing your job and take care of your family so we can reseal a parking lot when you give to the church and when you pray for Brother Farley who just had surgery on Friday. And we go through a list of all kinds of things. When you do your part and I do mine, we can do more. But we each have to own our own responsibility. So go next level uh, with responsibility in your work ethic. All right, and then lastly, verse 12. That you may walk honestly toward them that are without and that you may have lack of nothing. Number two, go next level with responsibility in public reputation. Go next level in responsibility, with responsibility in public reputation. Um, I saw a lot of you, um, I don't know if you were freezing corn or whatever, but a lot of you were taking corn off cobs and doing it in different ways. I saw a lot of creative things from our church family. This is Titus Schlegel, okay? I don't know where he got that knife. It looks like to me, I grew up with him like a Bowie knife. That's what comes to my mind. I was a big Alamo junkie, Jim Bowie, and a big old knife. It actually looks bigger than that maybe, but he's shearing corn. He's, he's taking the corn off the cob there. Uh, that's probably not the knife he should be using, right? And I think that's staged, at least I hope so, or he's, he's uh, maybe limping around tonight with a few injuries. He's using the wrong knife to do that application. The hat's a nice touch, by the way. I can just hear him with some Australian accent um, talking right there, if pictures could talk. Um, here's, here's a thought as it relates to our, our PR as the church. One of the things I think, here's I think the root of a lot of our issues is the local church. We're using lights, 
nothing against lights. We're using fog machines. We're using programming. We're using PR campaigns to try to compensate for where we should be loving as the people of God. A church that loves grows. A church that loves is effective. And it's amazing how the American church especially has sought to substitute love for other things to try to shape the public perception of their church. And Paul here says, if you'll just love people and if you'll own your responsibilities, those that are without, they will respond in an appropriate fashion. Have you thought about what our county thinks of North Life Baptist Church? Have you thought about what the city thinks of our church? Do they think that we're loving? If they don't, much of that is our responsibility. So may we not blame others, blame shift, may we instead own it with our sense of responsibility. So Paul here says that if we're faithful to steward what God has assigned to us, not only does it meet our needs at the end of verse number 12, but it also ensures that we have the proper reputation. Just because Christ is coming back for us doesn't mean we shouldn't do right by those around us and fulfill our personal responsibilities. Um, one author said this, churches and Christians who, don't, who defend their orthodoxy but don't pay their bills have no orthodoxy to defend. So if we're not doing our responsibilities, then everything else we say after that, cheating on our tax returns, twisting and distorting facts when it's convenient to our careers, whatever the specific, if we're not honest, it undermines everything that we stand for um, and claim to stand for as believers. We must take responsibility for our reputation. So may we not take advantage of people, may we instead do right by them. It could be something simple. Um, I was talking to somebody before church tonight, but just things like tipping, tipping a waitress. Thinking about that's a mom who's away from her kids likely, maybe a single mom, and, and, and don't cut her short. Do right by her. Do better by her than others around you. Um, and so may we do these kind of things for the sake um, of the gospel. All right, I want you to end tonight with me. If you go back to verse 3 in chapter 1 of our book here, 1 Thessalonians, would you go back to chapter 1 in verse 3? And as you're finding your spot, spot there, I've read several studies on this, um, but just came across this data again uh, in prep for tonight. Um, if I were to ask you, what is the leading cause of death in the United States, what would your response be? Some of you would know the answer to this, but what is the response? And you might, the cue would be our title of our sermon tonight, heart, right? Heart failure, heart disease. It is the number one cause of death in the United States. According to the CDC, on average, 660,000 people lose their lives to heart disease every year, 660,000. Um, and uh, it, it, is, it is definitely the blight of our day. We hear about cancer. We hear about all these other things, drunken drivers, but it, it's our diet, it, it's, it's other things that factor into that with our hearts that is having, wrecking havoc on our, our physical health. 17 people die every single day waiting for an organ transplant. They just need a new heart. If they could just have a new heart, they'd be fine. And the article I was reading was talking about possible solutions to this. So obviously to find a donor, that's a logistical nightmare. There's many more who need it that can get it, and then the matching and all the things that go with that, and you're on medication the rest of your life not to reject that organ. And so one of the things they've been working on are artificial type of sources of, of a heart. So instead of taking a physical heart out of a deceased individual, a donor, putting into a new body, other technology possibly, and can you believe one of the biggest issues is not the actual mechanism of the heart. Listen, it is what it takes to power it for the rest of that individual's life. It's not like you can just swap out batteries in the sense or have some. It, that, that's a very intimate part of your body, and there are all kinds of logistical things. And so one of the things that they're exploring right now, which is kind of crazy to think about, is actually trying to find a way to embed what would be nuclear-powered batteries. And they said, for obvious reasons, people are not real eager to take you know, uranium or plutonium or whatever and embed any form of that in their body. But their biggest struggle is finding a power source. And what's interesting, may I say to you tonight, that I would say also heart disease is likely the number one killer of churches. Heart disease is the number one neutralizer. We may still think we're alive and pretend we're alive, but we are dead, according to the standards of Revelation 3, 2 and 3. 
So I'd like you to think about this as we finish tonight as it relates to our heart. Notice verse 3, because I think this is the rub in our ministry. He says, remembering, so he's praising them, remembering without ceasing your work of faith. Notice this next phrase, and labor of love. I don't know that it's the love that's the struggle. It's the fact it's so laborious. It's so, it's a grind. It, it, we're not called to just love people for a week. I can almost love anybody for 10 minutes and smile and nod my head and say something nice at the end of that conversation. But if it goes on for two hours or two days or two weeks, or I see them again every day for the rest of my life, and we don't click, that's going to be a challenge. It's the endurance. It's the longevity of our love, listen to me, that basically causes us to reach the end of our own reservoir, to reach the end of our capacity to love. And listen to me, that's the moment that we can go to the next level. When they know I'm, I'm maxed out, but I'm still going to love you, and now I'm dipping into divine, supernatural resources, and they feel love that no one else has ever been able to give them. That's when the church goes to the next level. And so we have access to this quote-unquote nuclear power source that can sustain us, and that is the love of God shed abroad in our hearts. Here's the question, and we'll pray. Will you allow God to elevate our church through hearts that are loving, where do we need to be more loving? And number two, where do we need a greater abiding sense of personal responsibility? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word tonight.